Power Project crew, what's going down? Today we have a great episode for you. It's with our homie Corey Gregory, uh, aka Corey G, aka the guy that helped put Muscle Farm on the map. Um, he took a lot of everything he did with Muscle Farm and he implemented it into his own company, which of course is Max Effort Muscle. Corey Gregory is such an awesome dude. He is uh this this sounds like I'm almost dissing him, but when you look at him, he's very unassuming. You wouldn't imagine that this guy can squat, deadlift, and bench an insane amount of weight. Uh, he competes at 181, and uh, if you follow him on Instagram at Corey G, uh, you'll see like, oh my gosh, like this guy's lifting at 4 a.m. every freaking day. He's lifting more weight than most people, and he's extremely jacked and tan. On top of all that, he's a great family man. Uh, he Again, like I said, he's up at 4 a.m. every single day training, and then he's killing it in business, and then he's also just a phenomenal father. He's there for his family. Uh, you can see that he relaxes on the weekends. He's just like a, a, a normal dude, but he just happens to have the time and the ability and the capacity to do everything at an extremely high level, and you just can't help but admire him. We got into a bunch of his training methods, uh, why he uses, like, I mean, sometimes this guy will load, like, every single inch of the barbell with bands and squat just that. Um, he explains why he does that. He also explains why he feels lunges is the absolute best exercise that anybody can do for basically any part of your body. He even convinced us that like, Hey, okay. Yeah, we definitely need to get into doing a lot more lunges. Um, I asked him where the, uh, the hip hop influence comes from. Cause if you, if you follow him on, on Instagram again, at Corey Gregory or at Corey G, uh, you'll see that a lot of his uh, workout programs are like old hip hop album covers, and it's just really, really cool. And I, I love his answer, and I, I hope you guys love it too because it, it makes a ton of sense. Anyways, this guy's super inspiring because you you look at his body of work. He's worked with Arnold. He's worked with tons of people, uh, Ronda Rousey. Just I mean, you name it. And as far as like big name in the fitness industry, and there's a good tie to Corey Gregory, uh, including even the Reebok UFC deal, which we got into also. Uh, and again, on top of all that, he's just a, a big family man. And, you know, when it comes to being jacked and tan, that means having it all right. Like having the, the looks, the money, and it's just, he is the definition of jacked and tan real quick. Shout out to Piedmontese beef for sponsoring this episode. You guys know, we absolutely love it. Uh, you guys, you have to try it if you haven't already. It is second to none. It cooks faster, has more protein, less fat, tastes better than anything. Like I, I keep saying on all these podcasts that we did in Columbus, uh, every single night we went to a steakhouse. Every single night I was disappointed because it just doesn't taste as good as Piedmontese beef. Seriously, you guys need to head over to Piedmontese.com. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E.com. At checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT for 25% off your order. And if your order is $99 or more, you get free two-day shipping. Uh, highly recommend our uh, Power Project Deluxe Bundle or the Jacked in Tan Box. Uh, either, either one of those, you will not be disappointed. Anyways, I'm going to get out of your guys' way. If you guys dig this episode, please hit up Corey Gregory on social media. His links will be down in the uh, the YouTube show notes or YouTube description and iTunes show notes. Uh, yeah, let us know what you guys think. And please, please, please enjoy the show. Dude, yeah, going hey, on. you got that much of an accent. I'd be rocking this shit too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then people like, uh, when you have an accent, they kind of just believe everything you say. Dude, I'm telling you, right? Because yeah, like, you sound smarter, right? Exactly. You sound real smart. Yeah. All righty. Yo, so Corey Gregory, how, do, how the hell do you have time? To come kick it with us. You're training at four in the morning. You have like 75 kids. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a bunch of different businesses. I mean, dude, like how do you, how do you, how do you honestly schedule your time? Because you're powerlifting and bodybuilding mm -hmm. and you got the business boom and you got a lot of things going on. Sure. So it's, uh, I always talk about people always asking, why are you training so early? I'm like, yo, it's out of necessity. I used to train at seven when I was a personal trainer and I had all the clients and stuff back in the day. And as I got more businesses and they started rocking, they started getting earlier and earlier. And I realized if I still wanted to compete multiple times a year that I had to have truly uninterrupted time. I can't be fucking with my cell phone when I'm training. Like, I ain't down There's with no that. one to even text yeah, that early on. in the morning. Exactly, <laughs> right? they either coming home from the bar still. I ain't trying to hear what they're saying anyway. So it was like from four to six, I can get home, help my kids get to school with the wife. I can be, you know, to work or doing whatever content by eight. We're doing content the whole time now, but at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we got my crews there in the morning capturing everything, wrapping it, and it's on the app by nine. 
Mm-hmm. So it's like we got a system of the way that we create content, but I'm really just capturing what I do anyway. And we got 20 people. Uh, I have seven elite lifters now, raw, that are in that group and two pro cards natural. So out of the 20 guys, I mean, this is a pretty elite level of guys that we've built from the last like two or three years at the 4AM crew. It's legit, man. So you, you've been you've been lifting and you've been uh, bodybuilding and powerlifting and doing all this stuff, and now it's just a matter of like sharing it out, yeah, and then kind of deciding like, hey, like where should this one go? Should this one go on Instagram? Yeah, that's exactly should what this it is. one go on YouTube? And thank you so much for helping us with that and yeah, helping no problem, us with man. our more recent uh, website endeavor that we uh, underwent. But uh, how do you determine like where yep. something goes and like which thing to kind of like monetize and which thing to make for free and yeah. stuff like that? So really, it's like. For all the years at MP, right, I was just creating content that was just out there from bodybuilding.com and all that. And because I was just with the hopes that you would buy supplements one day, I couldn't really track it all the way, to be honest. But it kept growing, so I was like, fuck, I'll keep doing it. Um, but then once I left there and sold my shares of MP and went back on my own, I was like, well, I have to support myself different now. You know what I'm saying? So it's like this, like the way that I diet, the way that I train, that stuff's going to be for pay now. But the inspiration stuff is all free. I mean, and at the end of the day, like that, you know, that's the oxygen anyway. So people come to me because they want to be like, all right, how are you doing? Like when I did, I did Olympic lifting meet Friday, a bodybuilding show Saturday and did the powerlifting meet Sunday. And that one weekend, people was like, all right, this dude's doing something. Now I, I, I'm not a lead on any of them level wise, but at the end of the day, like I did pretty good, right? I squatted 500 raw at 178, you know, I freaking got second in the bodybuilding show. I did good, right? The Olympic lifting was kind of like some chump, chump weight, but whatever. We ain't going to go there. But, um, I was probably the most nervous though, just to land a snatch in front of people. Cause I had never really done it before. Yeah. <laughs> so, but people started to realize like, all right, this guy's, you know, I'm 41 now. I've been competing for 20 years. Um, some, there's something to what I got going on here. And so there's certain things that are, you know, kind of IP, and I charge eight ninety nine. It ain't shit. But at the end of the day, it's like the community and the amount of um, just content. I'm, I'm like my own Netflix as well. I look at it, bro. For why real. Why do you we train pro- like? Why do you train like such a lunatic? Because you're. <laughs> I mean, I'll see you do like you know you'll you'll you, we, you had me do the ten minute lunges, you yeah, know, yeah, and yeah. then I see you out on the track, you know, lunging like a quarter mile. Like no one does that. Yeah. Or I see you sprinting. Like people hate sprinting. Like wh- like yeah. why are you utilizing these so, techniques? This is what happened. This is how, so six or seven years ago. I was doing the traditional bodybuilding cardio. And for me, because the way I'm built already, I'm like a basically built like a fitness model. So I started getting like real kind of like, I don't know, like my muscle IG bellies. model. Yeah, man. my muscle bellies wasn't very full. And I'm already kind of like a tall and slender dude anyway. So, so man, I find I need a conditioning that is going to keep my, my just me looking thicker. So I went to the track, it really because I had real bad knee tendonitis at that time because I was jumping, trying to dunk, do some crazy <laughs> shit like that too. And I was like, man, what can I still do that can get my legs ready for the show? So I just stopped by the track on the way home from the gym, lunged 400 meters, and I couldn't walk for like 10 days. And I was like, what the? But I noticed my metabolic rate felt like it went, like it was on fire all day, way more than sprints even, which was interesting. So I was like, all right, there's something to this. I peel myself out of the car and I go back again. And then I got to the point where I was then, you know, at the point I was just doing 800 meters every day after lifting weights. I throw a 40 pound vest on. Sometimes I did a mile four days in a row fucking around one time. Like, oh, yeah, man, I'm on some <laughs> other shit. So I did. Yeah. <laughs> and so I did. My best was 303 days in a row at 800 meters, no matter what. And I was about 188, 190 pounds with ab veins. That was the best condition and strength and everything that I, I was at. And that was, and I, I missed the streak because I did a charity powerlifting meet at my high school that's a few hours away. I took all the equipment down there, had my family, and by the time I got back, I forgot to lunge. Like, I didn't uh-huh. quit because I was, like, tired or something. I quit because I was hosting something. <laughs> I got busy, and I got up the next day because I fell asleep early. I was like, fucking didn't lunge yesterday. <laughs> the fuck? So, but no, it, it's... uh the material I'm listening to, I'm listening to the podcast, I'm listening to you guys, I'm listening to people that are, you know, making me smarter while I'm doing that. It's like a state of flow when I'm done, man. And so I create a lot of content right after. Uh, I've also seen you and your crew do like uh, no weight on the bar, but literally no more space on the bar because it's all full of bands. Yeah. That shit looks so fucking scary. But like, where did that yeah, come from? Yeah. So here's one thing I am going to start doing for free a lot, Mark, because I think we're on to something. Now, look. I learned band training from Louis and Tony Ramos and all those guys that helped me at Westside. But what I found out is one, no one has a monolift. Well, we do, but most people don't, right? They can't mimic that at their own gym, especially at fucking Lifetime Fitness, right? 
So I came up with a way that you can have a couple hundred pound dumbbells and you can double up a minivan. And, you know, as long as you're a normal height, that's going to give you 80 to 100 pounds total at lockout, right? So I started figuring out, and we used to squat every day for a couple years. We messed around with that. But we've come out to five days a week. It's a front squat four days, and it's a back squat on Wednesdays, right? And we do uh, variations, conjugate. And I try to program to where it's like, all right, there's a five-count pause on a front squat. So you're going to be limited to how much weight you can get on that, right? But then we rotate two bands aside week one three bands a side week two, four bands a side week three. And so I got 400 pounds of band tension on week three. Then they're adding bar weight. My 165 just front squat at 455 yesterday. Like, yeah, exactly. And I got like 12 guys that can front squat over four bills. <laughs> and what I'm seeing is a direct correlation. Like my 181 just pulled 650 and he front squats 460. And we've seen a, a direct correlation to their front squat, to their deadlift, and it, it's nasty, bro. How much uh, tension do you think you have on there? So the base tension at lockout is about 80 to 100 pounds per set of bands. So basically, we're starting off the wave of 200 pounds of bands, 300 pounds, and 400 pounds. There's motherfuckers that come in to, to like just be like, can I jump in today? You know, you see it at your gym, yeah, too. And, like, oh. and it's four bands. I'm like, sure, bro. Just stay with the bar and just get just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're just not ready for the tension. We don't, like, I have one guy competing at the Arnold tomorrow. We don't touch a bar without the tension on the taper either. Mm. I just go bar weight plus band tension to opener. So the first time that he unracks that bar, it feels like a fucking toothpick. Right. Because he's so used to being mm. just stapled. So what I've figured out is a essential daily conjugate method squat with band wave that has made my guys freak shows. And so I'm going to start teaching this out because I think they can do it at any CrossFit gym. They might go up to four bands, but they might go one, two, three. Right. And that wave has been, it's been wild, man. You think it maybe just beats people up a little bit less? Uh, and think, then like if someone, if someone can squat, let's say 400 pounds, they could probably stand up with like 600 pounds for sure. And, and they could squat like 600 pounds of band tension because maybe at the bottom, maybe it's exactly. half of that or something yeah, like that. So it's about, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably half of that or maybe three quarters. So at the end of the day, it's like when we used to train with gear all the time, your nervous system gets so good that then you start getting all these uh, other weights and they yeah, feel like, sense. so you see what I'm saying? It's, it's, a, it's a little bit like training with equipment in a, in a way in or a way. training with a slingshot because yeah, exactly weights what it is. are lighter at the bottom, heavier at the top. It's exactly what it is. And so what happens is because their core and their, their, their front rack gets so, so good and they're so good at bracing that it just carries over so much the deadlift and the back squat. It's been pretty wild to watch, man. That's cool. What, what about you experimenting this way? Because it's like, you know, uh, Mark was mentioning the lunges that you do, which is yeah. just absolutely wild. Thanks, and man. also like all this band tension. Like, yeah, everyone uses, people use bands, yeah. but not to that extent. Not like us. So then, <laughs> like, I guess what gets you worrying in terms of thinking about things like this? Yeah, so it's, I think I, man, when I moved here, you know, 20 years ago, I had no clue all this stuff was going on in Columbus. I moved here because my friends was coming to Ohio State, and I found a spot that I could go to school for one year and start personal training. I didn't realize Westside Barbo was here. I didn't realize Arnold Classic was here. So when I started um, getting around some like real lifters and started to understand some stuff, I was like, I've never been a person that just completely follow. I've always been a person that goes, yeah, let me get that. You know, because I, I think I'm one of the only people that learn legit bodybuilding from Arnold Schwarzenegger personally and then also had been at Westside a bunch of times so like and then learned off John Bros who brought the kind of squat everyday system from the Bulgarian um Abijayev, I think that snatched like 500 so like I went and saw him in Vegas and fucked with him for a little bit so it's like I just keep these pieces and I think like how can I take these out to normal people essentially we do things that normal people can't do they're not going to put a fucking squat suit on and go 700 or double blue bands on the monolith. They can't, they can't replicate that, but they can replicate what I'm doing because a lot of these guys that come in, they were members on my website. They were doing these programs at lifetime. And I see this dude's doing man, 270 plot five plus three bands on a three count pause on a front squat, man, come on in here. <laughs> like, let me see, you know, let's get a crew around you and see what we can really do. So I just have always tested everything on myself first. And because I'm constantly competing, there's always a date on my calendar. I'm either doing bodybuilding or powerlifting, so I'm always testing things along the way. They don't always work, but I'm telling you, this thing right here, it works real good. I'm going to talk to Travis when I go see him, Travis Mash, about let me try this with an Olympic lifter. They got to get up out of the hole with the, you know, they get smashed in there and they got to come out like, I think this will work for them. And what I love about Louis Simmons is he's been testing this shit out in the garage forever, bro. He don't give two fucks. And that's how I, that's kind of how I operate too, to be honest. Like I look up to him probably more than anybody. 
you know, Arnold was always my idol from a bodybuilding standpoint. Yeah, I don't think Louis, uh, I don't think he has like uh, a degree in kinesiology oh, or like, oh, you know, he doesn't have a personal training oh, certificate. Man. And I think, you know, I, I made this point last night in a seminar that I did saying like, none of that really matters. It doesn't really matter where your knowledge comes from. Everyone has the ability to experiment and that's what you should be doing. Like exactly. try different foot positions on your squat. We we're just go. talking to Eddie Hall, the greatest deadlift of all time. And, and he was mentioning like uh, he had one day a week where he his feet would be in closer, and another day where his feet would be wider, and he found that that started working really well for there him. You go. So he, he kept doing it, but like there's he no didn't, one way, man. Yeah, there's no, <laughs> and you got to just keep trying. And somebody that you work with too, that is, I mean, you end up rubbing elbows with a lot of people that are really high level, mm-hmm. and uh, somebody that I. Uh, think is kind of under the radar that people I knew you were going to go there for sure much is, my uh, dude. yeah as Eric Serrano yeah you know, so and, uh, you've been working with him for, forever I mean he yeah. put BCAAs on the map yeah. uh, omega-3 fatty acids yeah. I mean he was kind of the Charles Poliquin like took the information and, and got Poliquin's it out there more mar- he marketed it better he marketed Serrano it. don't really fucking market yeah he don't <laughs> and he doesn't care he doesn't care he's like very straight so forward. Serrano this is crazy right so once again I'm here. I don't realize he lives literally 10 minutes from me. <laughs> Actually, he lives le- He lives in the development behind my gym, bro. Like, he's that close to me. So when I'm like 20, I'm trying to promote these uh, drug-free bodybuilding shows, but I need some somebody to help with the drug testing. So I started doing all this research, realized how smart he was, and I was taking Beverly International products at the time. He had formulated uh, Ultra Size. So his name's on the front of the jug. So I started Googling in this cat. I'm like, man, where's he at? That shit was good. Real good. That Real protein powder. I learned really a lot from those guys too before, you know, way before the MP days. And so I Google it and I realized, shit, Serrano's office in Pickerington, which is right down from where I'm at. So I start showing up at his office, right? So they're like, can't see him. Who the fuck are you? It's like fourth time I see him back there. And he's like, yo, like, what do you want? And this is my answer. I think we need to be friends. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm I like picture, yeah, I can picture you on yeah, your bike, that, dude, bro. <laughs> you riding like, up on your bike, bro. Like, I'm like, I think we need to be homies. And he was like, you know, fucking whatever. He's, he runs his mouth. He, I call him my Puerto Rican dad, man. He's been, he been helping me out for a long time. But here's why, though. Back to what we were talking about early. He knew, hey Corey, I want to try this. He tried this crazy creatine thing with me. What I was doing, like shit. I was taking like 37 grams of creatine a day. I was doing like we used to test stuff because. He knew I was attempting to get a drug-like response without taking drugs. So he loved that. And he was like, all right, with the BCAs, let's do 20 grams here. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do fat loading. We did this program where I went like, um, it was like no carbs. And instead of carb loading, we were fat loading. I mean, we did all kinds of wild shit, man, with 100 grams of branch chains. And so I was in like basically my own science project literally since I was like 20. So that's why, that's how I know a lot of this stuff is because I just live through it with high level people. And then on top of that, I'd be emailing Dr. Mario Di Pasquale because that's who Eric learned from. Yeah. And this dude who wrote the anabolic diet, he'd be emailing me and I couldn't even like answer him. He's so smart. I had to like research shit just to answer the damn emails. It's crazy, man. It's cool. Yeah. Serrano is under the radar though and really smart. Good dude. Uh, when it comes to the, like that and, and your BCAs mm-hmm. are second to none, dude, those are my absolute favorite. Thanks, man. So is that where it started? By yeah. Him? Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I brought him in and was like, you know, when we were going through the formulations and back in the day at MP and then just kind of carried on mm-hmm. from then. And it's at the point where, you know, I don't need them a whole bunch as much anymore yeah. because now we have a lot of the base stuff done and the, the manufacturer can tweak some things that they need. But we found out that like doing the branch chains, having we have 10 grams of branch chains with five grams of glutamine and then a hydration complex together, you know, per scoop. We put two in a gallon jug. We feel good. Yeah, I mean, there's like the uh, the pink lemonade. I think it's some kind of lemonade. We have a, yeah, we have well, we have a regular lemonade, and then we have um, we have like a sweet tea too that a lot of people mix and do Arnold Palmer. We got all kinds of stuff. Yeah, man. well, because cool. like I, I I tried it and I'm like, this is bullshit. Yeah, because like, this was before I had met you. This was at the old location. Yeah, yeah. You had sent a bunch of stuff, and then when I met you, I'm like, damn, like maybe this shit is legit. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm building this shit for me, bro, straight yeah. up. Like, I'm building it to to do to my craziness. I need all this. Mm-hmm. And so then when people are like, yeah, hey, I'm vibing with that. Like, let me try it. This dude's in his 40s. He's still doing all this. So. Yeah. So out of, like, all the experimenting, like, to try to get the anabolic effect but mm-hmm. still stay natural, like, what, yeah. what was, like, the biggest, like, combo that you were able to find that was like, oh, here we go? Yeah, so uh, I didn't look as good or perform as good when I was on low-fat stuff. Back in the let me eat seven meals – let me eat chicken every meal. As soon as uh, Serrano was like, yo, you need to eat way more beef. He's like, you need to make sure and keep your fats way higher. And this is like way before it was like super cool. Mm-hmm. And um, I, got, I finally got tighter. 
But my problem was I needed a mixture of that and with the lunge work. I think I just didn't have that because then I'd be so, I'd be walking these photo shoots and I, you know, to do fitness RX or whatever. And I could never like, I could barely squat 225. I was so weak, man. I'm just walking in there like I look good, but I'm thinking like, I can't maintain this. It just wasn't a lifestyle. You'd be in shape for like a week and then. Yeah. And then there'd there'd be a hard fall off. I'm like, this ain't really, this, I ain't really down with this anymore. So finding that, figuring that out, the lunges was part of it. I could feel like I was turning back to clock, man. I could feel my testosterone. Like I, I get my blood work done like once a year. I mean, mine, I think my testosterone was like high fours. It wasn't even anything crazy, but it's just that it probably stayed there for a long time. Mm-hmm. Hadn't had a super dip, a super dip like most do, but it was just one of those things where I could just, I could feel it when I wake up. Yeah. I could tell like, Oh, that protocol is doing this and having fats before bed or having, I would try different types of protein before bed. I, I've man, I've tested so many yeah. different things. So being like a leaner dude, like, mm-hmm. well, I mean, you, you look fucking phenomenal. Thanks, dude. Bro. Like every time you post something, I'm like, are you sure you're natty? Like I'm joking. I'm joking because <laughs> we, we had that conversation like through text message. Um, like, well, I'm not a very big guy. See, I think pe- pictures make yeah, me look sorry. bigger. Yeah. That, that's the thing. Like people are, it's all they see the picture on IG. They're like, this dude looks big. I'm like, well, that's, that's, that's way like 180. You know what yeah, I mean? Dude, that's yeah. a credit to you. That's good yeah. bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, yeah, I always try to be symmetrical. You're right. I wanted my back because like my low back gets crazy. Like, like guys that take drugs. I mean, with all the, the Christmas trees, nuts, mm-hmm. shit. And that's what people are like, damn, I don't know how you get in that condition. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years. <laughs> Well, I guess that's the answer. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, what about carbs? Like, cause what I was talking about, like a leaner person, cause like sure. for, for me, like I just feel better when I run on uh, higher carbs. Yeah. Uh, Mark and Encima, they love running on fat. Mm-hmm. When I eat too much fat, I just, I feel like, like, yeah, yeah. like I kind of feel sick hungry. So do you still keep the fats really high and the carbs low? Yeah. Or? So my carbs, I eat, uh, usually two to three sweet potatoes a day. So I have a version of my fasting that I teach on the site that has a little bit more carbohydrates. But if I'm lunging 800, I need that. Yeah, that's, that's well, and I noticed I evolved. So like what I could get away, what I needed to eat a couple years ago with now the muscle and the conditioning, like it's changed. Like my, I can tell my metabolism just so much faster. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's faster than when I was in my twenties, bro. Shit. Like and I would you, go through and smash like a whole bag of jalapeno potato chips and go eat some wings. We get some beers and I wake up. I'm like, damn, I still look good the next day. Like this is, I'm on to something for sure. Yeah. And when it, you're, when you're talking about need, you're, you're talking about like, you don't necessarily need it to like sustain, but you need it to have really good workouts Yeah, because you're working out really hard. And I think that, a lot of times uh, people are kind of missing that piece. It's like, mm-hmm. man, if you're not performing great in the gym, it's going to be really hard to change your body or to feel strong. Sure. You, said, you know, struggling to even lift like 225 and stuff like that. Yeah, I think just having that balance, right? You know that you're not spilling over, but that you got enough fuel, but also that you're at the spot where you can still force your body to change. It's a tricky combo, man. Um, and just so you can like be good in life. <laughs> right yeah. it's not we know we're like lifting 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 but like i still gotta like be a, i got three kids i still gotta be a dad you yeah. know i still gotta i got a f- couple businesses i still gotta be around i can't just be all about lifting yeah and then being good in life like you still <laughs> you still have like a beer like on the weekends yeah which is another I had five last saturday that's another, <laughs> yeah. five it's another aggravating thing because i'm yeah. just like i see he's he's smoking a cigar he's having a beer yeah and he's fucking jacked yep I'm trying to, I'm trying to show the lifestyle, man. I think because at the end of the day, once again, that's what people are doing. They don't do what we do. I remember trying to tell my clients that's a lawyer to eat six times a day. He's like, fuck off. I mean, he's like, I'm about to drink. I'm going to do this. So I was like, I've been searching for it for years. Like, how do I, how do I wrap this together? You know what I mean? So it's cool. As far as like, let's say a person that's just working out, they're trying to like get into the gym. A lot of people just hate lunging. Yeah. Right. That's what, that's another reason why I started. It hurts too. my knee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you actually yeah. said you had tendonitis and an yeah. individual that Cleared has tendonitis up. would be like, fuck, I don't want to fucking lunge. It hurts my tendonitis. So I'm assuming they're weak. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming lunging is one of those things that yes. you suggest people do. No but question. in terms of, I guess, general overarching concepts of things you should probably be having in your workout. Mm-hmm. What would that look like? What would you suggest? Yeah, I think, um, the base. So, you know, we talk all about lower back hamstring whatever because of power lifting but what i've seen you know helping the general population is that that's where they're all extremely weak too and that's why they don't want to lunge i've get so many people that have l5 s1 problems that when they lunge they don't realize their back hurts was really because their glutes and hamstrings are so fucking weak yeah and hips are tight and hips are tight and so they have all the problems that all power lifters are trying to not have happen right so so literally whether it's a person that is brand new if they can do lunges for 30 seconds, I'll start them there. So I'll say, you know what? 
do a minute of that, and then go walk on the incline, you know, for another 15 minutes. And that's your conditioning. And then we need to do four minutes of lunges. And then, so I, I'll bring them up that way. And what happens is, man, my back don't hurt no more. It's because, yeah, it's, you know, the glutes are supporting it now. So I really think we, we've been based, basing everything around the lower body stuff first and just getting them moving and then making sure I, I'm, the lunge and learn is kind of my thing. Like I'm making sure that they're, they're feeding something into their brain at the same time. So that's been a big, that's been a sneaky big part of it. How long does it take you to do a mile or half mile? Yeah. Lunge? So my, my best 400 meters is 807. And that's with knee touching every time, no extra weight. And then I usually try to go somewhere between like 18 to 22 minutes for a 400 or for 800. So a mile takes about an hour though. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how much game you got. And if you're messing with those longer duration ones, do you have any other stuff for your workouts? Yeah. So I I thought I was going to do a mile for a week. So I got on this kick one time I did you know, a mile with a 40 pound vest. I tried to do a mile with an 80 pound vest, right? I made it three quarters of a mile and I gave up and I was mad. I was like maxing out every rep on the, at the end of the third. I was like, you can fucking do this. I wish I knew David Goggins then. I would have been like, I I got this. But, uh, but no, what it came down to is obviously I couldn't recover from anything like that. So the mile lasted for four days and I was like, I can't recover from this. But I've noticed that between four and 800, depending on stress cycles and life, that's kind of where the where it is. Eight hundred, I, I want to dodge because it's hard. Four hundred is easy for me, but sometimes four hundred is better for bodybuilding. Eight hundred, I would look a little flat. Four hundred, I look just right. So I just kind of go on how I feel. What about like substituting for something like a split squat, like you know jumping split squats? Because if somebody's like, ah, fuck, where am I going to lunge all day long? Like- we do stationary inside during the winter. If like mm-hmm. so, basically, I'll say like just to make sure you get it done, go fifteen minutes for four hundred. 30 or 25 for 800 and they'll just do like stationary like you know push off push back mm-hmm. alternating legs yeah damn. um it wasn't until i saw your tweet saying like damn i've been going to the arnold since 1999 <laughs> that's when i was like oh shit it's real yeah boy what is this like dude so i mean this is so much a part of my career i mean i was selling programs here in 99 bro like that's how I get tickets to the expo. Like I'm out like, Hey, the pro-, like the people are like, what's a program? They don't even know that shit no more. Like I'm out here. Want to buy a program? Like, um, it was crazy because I saw Arnold last night at the charity event and it was cool, but it's like the hype is just, it's just like the deflated balloon. Yeah. Right. And, and I remember back in the day coming here, like, I hope these magazines see me. I could talk to the, I could talk to rich Gaspari, try to get sponsored. Like yeah. I mean, you know, way before the MP stuff. Um, this is, you know, I don't know. This is so nostalgic for me. I don't even look at my, I look at my calendar, but I don't really talk about my career from January to January. It starts here mm-hmm. and kind of evolves to the Arnold. So every year I kind of, as I'm driving downtown, cause I live here, I'm like reflecting on, oh shit, man, this is where I came from. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is what's happened this last year. So it's a little wild. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. I remember seeing all the WPO finals stuff here back yeah. in the, I mean, they, they rekindled it over there, but which is cool. It, it will probably never, you know, never be not with Chuck on stage and shit <laughs> yeah. like that, bro. No, you saw a lot of that stuff. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing uh, Steve Goggins uh, do the first 1100 pound squat. You know, and, and then to kind of have, you know, this thing end up the way it is this year because of the coronavirus. Is, yeah. It's been sad. It know? is real it's sad. Just, it's but it's probably the right thing. I mean, it you know, be. it's a breeding ground, bro. Yeah. 200,000 oh, people yeah. jammed in a place that is actually too small. Oh, yeah. You know, and you, you go in those bathrooms and it's just oh, like, oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. So there was part of it that you're like, oh, man, all right, I, I got to deal with parts of that. But at the end of the day, like it's so like i said it's the only trade show i do i know you do other ones too but just getting to see everybody especially being local i definitely miss it man i was a little sad it's for big, sure it's a big part of columbus for sure 50 million part bro <laughs> you know you talked about actually selling programs in 99 and yeah. now you have this online programming that you're doing you have mm-hmm. a bunch of other businesses that you talked sure. about that means that you're just continuing to evolve so yep. like with what you're doing now in terms of fitness how are you continuing to progress? How are you mm-hmm. continuing to move the needle forward in terms of what you do? Yeah, so it's been a wild ride because I go from selling programs in 99 to handing out the Arnold Classic Trophy with Arnold on stage and like when Muscle Farms at, at the height of 2014, right? And I got the, I'm the diamond sponsor. I got the biggest everything going on here. And then to leave that and then have to come back humbly with a two spot thing and be like starting over, you know, direct to customer. It's not going to be as big with retail and all that. Um, that was just an interesting kind of, you know, kind of wave of events for me. But because this is my roots and because I was like, man, I, this is how I built it the first time. I'm going to rebuild it again differently. And, and that's a better lifestyle for me and my family. And man, it, pushing the needle all comes based around 
what am I testing? How am I, how am I trying to force my knowledge from nutrition or training that people can do and make themselves better? So what I've been forcing myself to do now is a lot more of this type of stuff. Um, because teaching, I was going to, I think I was going to, like, I thought I was going to be a gym teacher first. Cause when I, in my coal mining town, no one was a trainer, bro. So like, I, I didn't have anybody to look up to. So the only thing I knew was like, all right, well, the gym teacher looks like he got a cool job. So, and then my wife was in education too. So like, that's just been like real ever present for me. And I feel so blessed of what's happened that I have this like burn now to just kind of get it out. Right. So I've been really pushing myself to move the needle, not only as a master's lifter now, which sounds funny. <laughs> <laughs> fuck but to push myself now because honestly i'm not lasting cats i can't beat them when they're 20 but when they're 40 they ain't around so i really think i got some things i can hit um i'm going back to powerlifting gear because i'm an extreme motherfucker so i'm like let's put the suit back on see if i can squat 781 or more and so i'm pushing myself and and i've always like i ain't done that yet i ain't done that yet let me you know let me let me just get these things and and knock them out so i'm just always put, me I just never, I'm satisfied and happy, but never, I always get that itch and it's still there. So I'm going to keep scratching it. How do you think you've been able to outlast everybody? You know, like you're, oh, man, you're, you're like always healthy. At least it appears. For you the know? most part. And I, I want to talk about that in a second though. I'm going to tell you about a real injury that, got, that got me. And, and mo- I, I've asked other people in the past and just most savages, what I've learned is they just don't admit like that they're hurt to yeah. themselves. Even we, we always bring up, <laughs> we, we always bring up Mike O'Hearn, you know, cause yeah. it's like, damn dude, you're still going. And he's like, yeah, he's never been hurt. And he's like, I've had a couple owies. Yeah. He's so. <laughs> been dinged up. I'm sure from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. So for yourself, have you, how have you been able to, you know, keep everything together? I had a real reality check last year. So I was uh, in 2010 or 11, I squatted my first 700, actually my second time 700. And when I was locking out the weight, the weight on my left side slipped down a little bit. I just didn't stay tight. And I never, I was like, I was kind of sore, whatever, never got it checked out. So fast forward, I've been lifting kind of around it for a long time. While I was doing the arch, the arc bar, which has that little bow on it, uh, 185 on incline, like eight months ago being dumb but i was testing something like what if i go wider i'll probably get more chest mass whatever and so <laughs> yeah this is the shit that happens to me right and so i'm doing 185 just for a regular set i don't know eight or whatever and and i feel something it's like boom my dude grabs it he's like you good i'm like i was like man i think maybe my labrum's gone or something i tore my labrum in my hip and i just kept rolling the lunges actually helped it so and i was like well so i went to my surgeon uh, this dude I know is on the get stack plan. He's on my app and everything. And he's testing me out. He's like, ah, I don't know if anything's like too bad. Let's get an MRI. Comes back to fucking super spinatus ruptured off. So it's gone. Rolled over. Shit. Yeah. So that's your rotator cuff. Yeah. Y'all don't know. That's one of them. And he's like, bro, he's like, this is real. Yeah. Right. That's exactly how I looked, bro. I was like, <laughs> he goes, now this is like, you're down like 10 months. And I'm not talking like you can be lunging and he's like, you can't move this thing. He's like, and if I don't, this is what got me, Mark. If I don't fix it in 12, I can't ever fix it. Mm. And I was like, whoa. So, you know, mind you. You got to get to it early, right? You have to, you have to make a decision. So, man, I go up and see Louie. I go see Matt Winning. I go see all these people like, anybody know anybody that's like done this? Because I had already built a compensation pattern around it half hurt. Louis like, just inject it with saline. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Louis like, I think you'll be fine. Go over and talk to that guy. <laughs> There's some dude in from Australia doesn't even know. A that's, bag full of peptides yeah, dude, or something. Yeah, dude. So it was funny. But uh, so I, I started kind of going around from all the smart people I was like, you know, close to. And here's the crazy thing. I think I had built the conversation pattern around it for so long that now it was real hurt and it was sore, but I didn't really feel that bad. So I'm talking to the doctor like, I'm pretty sure like I'll be cool. He's like, there's not really like a handbook for guys like you. So he's like, most of the time it's like a grandma is like ripping this thing when she's like putting her groceries away and I got to fix it. He's like, but how about this? See how it progresses for 10, 12 weeks and then come back to me or whatever. So man, I get back into the gym. I deadlift 500. Doesn't hurt. Start pull-ups was a little weird because it's a little tight. But so over the last seven or I didn't get it done. I said, fuck it. Because I've never missed more than a week's workout since I was 17, bro. I couldn't even like identify with that. I thought he was talking like a different language to me. I was just like, I don't even like, so the, but what, here's what happened is I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me though. And I'll tell you why, because the gratitude of all them years of me being crazy, get one down to 165, I weighed 240 before I've done gear, no gear, powerlifting, all these different bodybuilding shows. Like, and I've been able to build these businesses. I never really got hurt. And I think it's, I was taking care of myself, but I felt blessed. 
So I had to learn all of like Matt helped me with this three to one ratio upper back to pressing. I was always one to one or two to one with Arnold stuff and that helped a ton. So I have this whole process I do to activate everything before I even touch a press. Um, I can do 35 pull-ups again. So the latch strength helps a ton. Um, I can bench like 275 again. At, 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 I only bench like 320 at 181. So it's not like crazy far off, but I'm also taking my time. I'm doing reps again with 80 pound dumbbells. It really hasn't limited anything and I can low bar still. You didn't go under the knife. I did not get it. No, I never got it fixed. So I just said, fuck it. I got one less shoulder muscle. Let's figure this out. So here's what I did though. This is what you guys will love. So I get that news. I'm like kind of licking my wounds for about a week. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to sign up for a fucking bodybuilding show. Fuck this. He says, I need something to do tons of volume, try to figure it out, not lift heavy. And so here I go. I sign up and I do this uh, natural show up in Akron and they have physique and you can, you can cross over to natural bodybuilding, right? So I do both of them. I've never even done physique before because I always thought it was, I don't know, I wasn't really into it, whatever. And so I fucking win the physique thing and get my pro card in this organization three months after I ripped my fucking super spinatus off. And it, my, my shoulder was a little flat, but it's because I, I got so lean and I still had enough muscle from previously, but I couldn't do arms or shoulders the whole prep. Wow. So I come out of this thing like, all right, I could have been under the knife. I felt a lot, you know, I, I went through those emotions. I said, fuck it. I did the show instead. And so all these people were like, of course, that's what you did. That sounds about fucking right. I'm like, yeah, I just, you know what? I want to challenge myself to do once again, maybe something no one's really done before. And, and I need to battle my own demons along the way. So it was cool. It was a good experience. And then now I'm able to low bar again. I took, um, I've been taking like five, five fifty with camera bar and bow bar and a bunch of different stuff and I can put it in the right position. So I'll, I've been good lately. I think I'll be able to compete and do something crazy soon. You know, I'm curious about this, what your advice would be to lifters in this situation, because we had JP price on yesterday. Okay. Um, he had his hip scoped out and other stuff. Then he went to Stu, Stu McGill and Stu was like, you probably didn't need to get that. Cause he had something somewhere else. That was the real injury. Mm -hmm. And he's already gotten, I think he's something happened with his spine where they went in and they cut some nerves some out of his nerves, spine yeah. too. Damn. And that wasn't even the problem. Right. Ooh. And he, he like, and even myself, I've had multiple things where doctors wanted to cut in and I was like, let me see if I can do something I outside and it, and things recovered. Mark, you had, a, you know, you didn't get, I mean, you didn't have a yeah, hip never surgery, surgery or anything surgery like that, him. even though you I mean, fell under, you've tore a few things off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, right? legitly yeah, a bunch yeah. of stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so with a yeah, lot of rubs, rub some dirt on it. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So with a lot of athletes, high level athletes, whatever, middle level athletes that are, you know, they get an injury, they go to the PT, they're like, mm -hmm. Oh shit, you need to get this surgery or this surgery. And that's from a doctor. That. Yeah. What advice would you give them to try and figure out what they should do? So I think like for me, I'm probably extremely in tune compared to most. So it was a little bit, maybe it was still a hard decision. I think if you don't really know your body, you have a hard time being like, have a real like thought provoking, uh, like definitive answer because you don't really know where I was like, I know how I feel. I can do this and it's still sore because it ripped off. Like once that, once those nerves are done, like I'm not even going to feel that anymore. The stability is still pretty good. So I was like trying to make my own rationale. I think if you don't really know, you have to rely on that. Right. But from a lifter standpoint, you have to look at, I'm not breaking world records, man. If I was Eddie Hall, maybe, or here, I'll give you one that's even more value. If I couldn't throw with my kids and it was my right arm, I'd have got it done. That's it. If I can't throw the football with my eight-year-old, bro, it's, it's a wrap. I would have got surgery, but it's my left arm. <laughs> and I'm not breaking world records. And if I can still, if I can still, so competing is about me having the butterflies, having the practice sessions, which is the 4 a.m. crew, having the prep time. It's about that process that people lose after high school. They don't even realize they miss it. That's what keeps motherfuckers together. So if I can still do that, which I thought I could, then there was no reason to go through that. That, that, that was my rationale. So I think every lifter has to look at, you know, um, I can't really do snatches anymore, but I don't make my money doing CrossFit. I love how far removed we are from like the general pop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're just making these crazy rationales. Yeah, well, because even what you said is like, it's still, it's still crazy. Like you said, uh, you know, challenging yourself with these competitions and people, people, lo people, uh, lose it after high school. A lot of people never even have it ever. Yeah, they don't ever, right. they don't ever experience it. And sometimes it's just a matter of like, I don't know, like maybe they were the class nerd or maybe yeah. they were the fat kid or they sure. were picked on or whatever. And they never had confidence to really try anything or do yep. anything or, or experiment the way that we experiment yeah, for sure and so hopefully when people you know listen to shows like this or see the information you put out 
hopefully they can get just a little spark of confidence yeah, and start out with walking or Absolutely. trying some of these lunges or you know some something uh you know some lower barrier of entry just have an expectation thing. on yourself yeah it, it doesn't ma- have to be world record that's why i always right. tell people like you're not going to go and do what i do but what's your version of that mm-hmm. oh you got you know your graduation you party something. you're going to and you want to look good or you got spring break vacation like it's got you got to have your own competition in life you got to challenge yourself and i just think people keep lowering expectations of, of themselves every day it's just easier yeah I, I like how you like set the uh you prioritize your shoulder like yeah if if i did make money on it yeah i would get it worked on but when you said like if i couldn't throw football with my kids i would have got it done there's i a, couldn't imagine dude. not being able to do that yeah, I think that's so powerful for people yeah. because there are some meatheads that are just stuck in their ways, right? They're sure. just like, no, I got to lift weight, got to lift weight. But it's like, dude, prioritize, right? Yeah, it would have been terrible. I think my business would have took a hit because I couldn't train. But then, you know, I can't, the dad part can't take a hit, man. They already, ta- they already, you know how it is. They already sacrificed enough for our oh, crazy yeah. ass, bro. <laughs> my kids, like my kid now is a freshman in high school. He's lifting weights. Nice. He's getting strong. He only weighs like 130, but he deadlifted uh, conventional, pulled 275. I had him back squat like 210 plus 120 in bands the other Damn. day. Like he's starting to, and I could see that grind. And he's like, you know, starting to buy in, but I'm his old man. You know how it is, man. They don't like all his friends are like, Hey, when are we working out with your dad? Like, mm-hmm. and he's like, Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? yeah. It's funny. He wants but, nothing to do with it. But right? what I, what I saw the other day, Mark, he's a lot, a lot more reserved than me. I saw him pull from a dead, pull a deadlift. That was that tweener. You're like, ah, should I pull through this rep? Should? Yeah. And I saw that shake, that grind from the mid shin. And I was like, Oh, there it is. <laughs> and I could see the confidence. Like, Boom, just tick up just a little bit. And then we took the bands off after a four week cycle, throws five mile an hour faster on his fastball and baseball. He's like, Oh, okay. I'm like, I told you you want to be a freak, let's go. You right. know, so it's one of those things where confidence, man, from the day I touched the weight, I built my confidence. And that runs everything. And I don't give a fuck what anyone says. If you work on that and weightlifting does that more than anything. I think a lot of times maybe we're not taught to try hard enough or to um or to even think hard enough. And a deadlift is a great example of that because you go to pull on a deadlift and you're like, I can't, I just tried it. I can't, like if you told me, hey, try this weight and I've never done it before, I go to pick it up and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, it's too much. Yep. Like, well, no, if you, you know, just, if you actually try harder, yeah. you probably are plenty strong to lift it up and it takes you three or four seconds sometimes for the weight yeah. to start to come off the ground and you're like, oh, okay, Here now the weight's magically floating off the ground just because you put a little effort in. Man, there's a lot. And just that, that grind, I, I, I've always been just a grinder mentality in general. You no, know, my life's different, man. My kids ain't living in a trailer like I was. They don't, you know, I'm, I'm dropping them off in a rolls, bro, because that's what I want for me. You know, that, but he just happens to be along for the ride. So to be able to try to input some of those things that made me, me, he, he's never going to really know. So I got to find these things, but deadlifts a deadlift. Doesn't matter who the fuck you are or what's happening, pulled off the fucking ground. And that's what, and so like I, I saw that a little bit and that, that was in the work ethic. I'm displaying work ethic. I'm at the end of the day, he hears all the crazy shit. So it's like, but it is a little bit of a challenge because of what I wanted for myself. Now the next generation is being taught, but they also along for the ride. So it's never going to be like that as grimy. It's just, it's not possible, man. What's something that you, you've taken from bodybuilding, um, that you, you know, have, uh, kind of put into your regular life, like a discipline from bodybuilding. And then also separately, what's a discipline from powerlifting that you've implemented into your day to day or business? I think the discipline of the food, man, from bodybuilding, right? It's, um, yeah, that part's tough. For oh man. Like I remember I'd be living on campus with my friends, even though I wasn't going to school, I was building my business. I'd go out to these campus parties, dudes mm-hmm. just drink a keg beer and whatever. And I'd be drinking water cause I have a, you know, a show coming up or whatever. Are oh, you too good to drink? I'm like, nah, I got, I got a bodybuilding show. I thought bodybuilders is big. Like, well, now they got weight classes. And then finally I'd be like, motherfucker, look at this. Boom. Hit him with the abs. They're like, oh shit, what's your diet plan like? You know what I mean? So it's one of those things. I think that non-negotiable discipline, similar to business, it's a build, right? Every show you build on, you got these weeks of prep, you got this thing. It's like, it really, to me, made, and that's when Arnold used to talk all about that, man. It just made so much sense. And when I could find it for real, it made it more of a lifestyle. It made all the difference. So like people really can't jive with that type of discipline. The food is always their problem. And so I think like that is huge. And from a powerlifting standpoint, man, this is why I love Tony Ramos, which, you know, the 181 from West side, like he would come when I would take these bigger weights for me, especially in gear. And I just love the fact that 
especially as my career progressed, not everyone loves me. Not everyone loves you, right? So you get up to these meets and you got these people and I'm like, yeah, a couple percentage of these people are here to go, go Corey. Yeah. Most motherfuckers want to see me not get it. And I think when Tony said this to me one time, he goes, this is the fucking, I bought the ticket to the fucking show, bro. Like I came to see like, none, half these motherfuckers don't want to see you win. So fucking show me something. Like I love that on display Show up right now. The fucking weight's on the bar. No motherfuckers can help you. It's you. And I think that that right there about powerlifting, I think about that when I was trying to get Arnold to be my business partner. I'm walking in the room like, motherfucker, I'm getting this weight. I'm getting this thing done. I'm not coming out of here without the result that I want. Put it on my back. Like, I, I like that fucking like challenge, bro. I think the power, that's why the power bug bit me hard like that. Because I love the fact that it does nothing matters. I go in my gym, them dudes kick my ass every day. They don't give a fuck about what I've done. I'm their coach, essentially, and helping them. But at the end of the day, I'm getting my ass kicked by my 165s all over the place right now. And there's nothing I can do about it. You know what I mean? Except for keep training harder and keep coming back for more. So I just think those life lessons apply to business. They apply to everything, man. Yeah, powerlifting, you know, as you see the weights stack up, as you see more and more in front of you. You can't be intimidated no, by man. It, much you can't like be scared saying, to take the weight. Partnering up with Arnold or something like yeah. that. I told AJ Roberts this um, a long time ago. He'd come to me for business. That's how a lot of the West Side relationships were. These guys would be helping me with lifting and I'd help him with business. And he's like, Man, I'm a, I'm you know, I'm afraid to go out on my own, which he ended up. And I'm like, dude, it's like taking it's like taking the same PR all the time. You just going in and taking the same weight because you're scared. He's like, Oh fuck. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> like yeah, I'm like, dude, just it made sense. Yeah, yeah, it made sense to him. It's true. <laughs> Um, so we know you you're up with, with the uh, 4 a.m. crew, mm-hmm. um, but still, dude, how do how do you? <laughs> He's how, like, like, come on, how, how the make it sense. Fuck, do you balance it all though? You know, the yeah. multiple businesses, the family. So the, I'm sure how, they mean energy levels, right? Like, yeah. How, how do? How, <laughs> well, how I like caffeine, to, that's yeah. for sure. But um, I try to go. I try to have a hard cut off at bed, like ten. And sometimes it can be eight thirty if I'm super beat. Sometimes it's eleven thirty if we got stuff going on with the kids. Um, so I just try to have that balance and my wife knows I'm like, look, I'm just, I'm whipped. It's 10 mm-hmm. o'clock. You're going to have to handle getting the kids to bed and stuff. And that's the kind of the conversations we yeah. have to have. You yeah. have to have a good, you have to have like, she's down since yeah. day one. She was painting the walls on the gym when I was 20. Like she's been here for the whole ride. She believed in it. So and, multiple years. Right. Cause I know there's, sure. there's dudes that are listening. Like, dude, my girl doesn't get it, but like, she might not be the one either that, <laughs> that or <That's> real. <laughs> That is real. Don't break up with them. Yeah, just yeah. Yet. Or it's just they don't realize how serious you are. Well, here's the thing is, right? I was out here speaking all this nonsense. A lot of people wouldn't believe in what I was saying. And so she always didn't understand it, but she believed in me. So now it's like I've been proving it so many times. She like I'll throw out something like, I'm about to do a squad documentary or something. She'd be like, well, when are we going to have time for that? I know you're going to do it if you want to do it. Like, and so it's one of those things where now that's, that's changed. So yeah, you might have a person that their brain can't grab what you can, because no one can really understand what you really believe in, right? Mm-hmm. The slingshot, you believed in it from day one, right? But the people around you aren't no going to. No one else did, yeah. Exactly. So people aren't going to believe it like you believe it. So I think you can't really make that person, but you have to be able to say like, you got to support this stuff if we're if we're down to ride lifetime together and that that right there and you know there's things that I don't do or she'll hold me back from that I need help back from I need that balance because there's no off off switch really you know mm-hmm. so you know I'm curious about this real quick mm-hmm. more of an applicable thing again because um a lot of uh, athletes and you're someone who does an insane amount of training volume and insane amount of work every single day. Um, and a lot of athletes have certain recovery tools that they swear by. They're like, oh, yeah. this is my X factor. This is my sure. X factor. Sometimes they keep it from people. Sometimes they share it. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that you do that's uncommon? Like, yeah, you get enough sleep, all these mm-hmm. other things. But is there anything that you do that's uncommon mm-hmm. that most athletes don't do that they probably should be doing to that's continue great. at a high level? Because you're 41? Yeah, I'll be 42 this year. Yeah. 42 this yeah. year. And you're still at a high fucking level. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, there is. I think couple things i always had this like ideology about my sleep was just better than everyone else's <laughs> so i'll tell you how i proved that though so i never really went to like no sleep lab or anything but i would wake up pretty rested if i would if i would get five if i'm on five i'm 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 good i was like i just think my sleep's like sweeter than yours basically right 
And so I was, I wore that whoop band thing that's real popular right now, which is probably the best. And you broke it. Yeah. I got that. <laughs> it said, fuck you, basically. <laughs> and so here's what was interesting. I started taking um, thousand mig CBD. We, we sell one of those products before bed too. I don't take it during the day, but I take it before bed to have like even another level of relaxation and for anti-inflammatory. So I started take I started um, doing the whoop thing. I wore it for three months. They sponsored my podcast. And then I was like, all right, cool. Uh, I'll just try it out. So anyway, I'm getting these readings back of my like REM sleep, deep sleep and everything. It's 97%, 99%. I'm falling asleep in two minutes. So yeah, right. So it was sweeter than most. So motherfuckers are getting eight hours. They ain't fucking with my five hours. <laughs> and so here's the, here's the reasoning though. Um, I keep my insulin stable during the day. I spike it before bed. It gives me a natural crash. I take the CBD for the anti-inflammatory. I'm tired because I've been putting out all day. You put out a lot of energy all day. That's you a huge it. factor. Yeah, That's right? Factor. Training and then mind. And then so I'm getting five hours, optimal kind of like mini quality crash of insulin that kind of gives you that that when people mm-hmm. are at their desk and they're about to nod off. But I do that on purpose and then rock with the CBD. And man, I'll tell you what, I feel, I feel rested when I wake up. And I feel like... I'm getting up to do something I love to do, whether I would make money at it or not. See, people don't really understand that. They're like, I just don't know how you do it. If I told you this, something that you love to do, that's the only time you could do it without getting interrupted, you would do it. Mm-hmm. That's it. So that, Yeah, a lot of people get... Um they get confused about, you know, people waking up super early. Yeah. You know, I don't think everyone has to like shift into no. trying to wake up at three to get to the gym at four necessarily, nope. but it's just how my life evolved. Yeah. And I, but I do think it's important for if you can, if you can get to sleep earlier than what you're normally doing and it doesn't disrupt your life, yeah. then you should. Yeah. And hopefully because of that, you'll be able to wake up a little bit earlier. I think yeah. it, it just makes sense. I think sure. for most people to try to, you know, get their day started a little mm-hmm. earlier. Some people like to kind of work through the night, though. I know, like Dave Tate. I know Some a lot of night owls. I know a lot of successful people. They like mm-hmm. to, you know, kind of work more through the night. But I've always hated that. Uh, you know, trying to get your day started at like mm-hmm. nine or ten. Like that's never felt never felt right for me. No, it feels like especially when I go to the West Coast, man. I'm all messed up because I'm like waking up at one, and then yeah. I'm like, we're sur- things ain't rolling early out there. A lot of times, especially in L.A., it was like nuns haven't told like eleven. Oh, I was yeah. tripping out. Uh, back to your question that I want to answer a little bit better is, so I do see a Cairo, um, not, not every week, but a couple times a month that works with like a lot of like USA wrestling and stuff like that. Dr. Tyler is a real good dude. Um, I do, I did have a, like a PT that would work on me once or twice a week with the gun and just hit stuff that was tight. Like, you know, I had like a partial glute tear a really long time ago. So I get on the, my left side and then I have that labrum that's torn on this side. So like a hypervolt type. Yeah, thing. exactly. So I have one of those in my house and I had a guy that I worked with, especially when the shoulder got hurt. Um, I worked with once or twice a week for 20, 30 minutes. So here's a funny, cause I have some friends in the NFL. I was like, what's the vets doing? Cause I treat myself like a pro athlete, basically like, bro, they're always in the training room. You should be in there. So I don't really like massage because I always feel weird when I lift after that, even multiple days. Like, all right, I'm trying to stay tight. Then I feel loose as a mud. Like I, so I don't really feel a massage, but I do do the hypervolt gun. And I think at the end of the day, even though I eat, you know, real well, I got to make sure that my hydrate, my hydration's everything. I can feel the difference when I wake up because I monitor all that. So I might be looking dry when I'm getting a pump on, but then I can feel it when I'm taking big weights. So that right there, it's hydration and the hypervolt. Other than that, man, I really think it's keeping my insulin stable. I think that's where my energy comes from because I take caffeine before the gym. I take a little caffeine before I lift and a little before I lunch, and then I don't take any the rest of the day. So my last caffeine serving is at like 6 a.m., and then I don't like get like a hard fall off later. So a lot of people that are listening to this show, you know, they want to get lean. They want to get in better shape, um, and you've done a great job of that, and you've helped a lot of people. Um, what are I know that sometimes there's you're going to change the diet up a little mm-hmm. bit depending on where someone is and if they're starting out and stuff. But if someone's just listening to this, um, what do you think a good place for them to start would be for them to start to lose a little bit of weight? I think, you know, I got the crazy uh, fasting protocol that I teach on my site. but I still think going back to the early stuff, like how we used to do is the best way to start. I think them just having like four or five small things kind of a day, but don't make it too crazy. Like if they want to eat yogurt with fruit in it, cool. Like I just general like, 
having a, a halfway decent breakfast that just isn't have any carbs in it. See, I think that's the Maybe thing. Like ditch some processed foods. Yeah, just get have rid some, of carbs. Have at some breakfast. eggs. Have some. You know, I don't even eat much dairy personally, but have some eggs. Have some yogurt. Have some meat and green vegetables. Like just very basic stuff that doesn't make you hard. I think that the insulin's everything. That's how the bodybuilders mess with it on the big level. That's what. So if your insulin's stable, you're going to feel better. And this is the best way to explain it. Diabetic patients are supposed to be between 90 and 120 when they check their insulin. Most people are fucking blowing that out of the water all day long, but don't understand that at all. And they wonder why they feel like shit. People are used to feeling like shit. That's their normal. If you understand how to feel good, it, it, you'll never go back. I just think people are so used to feeling like shit. Yeah. They, like even if you ask somebody, if you said, Hey, how do you feel? They, a lot of them would be like, ah, I feel okay. Yeah. I they don't realize good. how terrible it is though. <laughs> but then if you start to dig deeper and start Man. to really, how's your energy like midday, you know, yeah. and, and how's your sleep and yeah. how's this and how's that? And then you start to find well, out. Well, most of those people sleep terrible too. Like a lot of my clients I had tested that they're like, they're not following their diet. They're waking up seven times. They don't know they're waking up, but that, that whoop thing shows you woke up seven times and i always thought like you know when you drink beer and you pass out basically you're like oh i slept good well i was at a 92 percent woke up six times when alcohol was present and then on a normal day 97 to 99 so i was able to see those things which was real cool but other than that the recovery thing it couldn't even identify with all the shit i was doing it was like because you know tommy counts volume west side counts so i counted the volume one time counting the lunges too I was like 200,000 something pounds or something crazy. He was like, that's fucking nuts. <laughs> so it, like Andrew, I think he mentioned, or actually, I don't know if it was you. You said like a few nights ago, you had like five or six beers. So you're aware of what it does to your sleep, right? For sure. But with this fitness thing, not as many people are as deep as we are, yeah. right? They do have goals. They want to be fit, but they also want to live a relatively normal lifestyle. Yeah. Now, Mark doesn't drink much at all, yep. barely, maybe a few glasses of wine every now and sure. then. But what would you, what advice would you give an individual who wants to do this, but they also want to just like live a fairly normal life? They don't want to cut drinking out totally. I got it. It's there ain't no fucking Super Bowl on Tuesday night. What the fuck are you drinking beer for? Straight up, like have an occasion. Like Friday Friday nights, we go to. I have a pub in my basement actually too, so I got to be real disciplined. I got Guinness on tap like the whole night. I love it. <laughs> so I went to Ireland with the Guinness. Like I love dark beer. So. You know, but on Friday night, me and my wife are going to grab some, like, that's, I can have a cheap meal. I can drink some beers. Like, that's like, we're going to enjoy a good conversation. My kids are old enough. They can stay at home now and do their thing. And so, like, I think build it around something actually happening. Mm -hmm. The fuck are you drinking Bush Light for on Tuesday night for? I mean, you're going to training is going to feel like shit. Does it enhance your motivated. experience? You know, like, yeah. does it enhance your experience that you have with your wife, girlfriend, whoever, whoever yeah, it might be? And if know, it does, then fucking go for it. And I just look at, like, the way I teach, it's like, eat you know, relatively well, 80, 90% of the time, especially if you're a general pop and enjoy yourself. And what people trip out about with me is they'll see me out living it up more than them, but they don't realize what I did all week. Like this motherfucker had five pints, which are 16s. He's eating wings. And then they see me on IG the next day doing ab poses. It's like what the fuck is going on here? And I'm like, Oh, but that's the, having that combo of, but Arnold says something to me. I'll never forget. He was like, it's good to have a little dysfunction with all the discipline. That's it. I was at his house for something, smoking a cigar, drinking some cognac or some shit. He's like, it's good to have the dysfunction with all that discipline. Fuck yeah, I feel that. You know, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, to get some sort of balance so you're not a maniac all the exactly. time. Exactly. I mean, look, we're all, the reason why we become successful is because we're obsessed. And so we need to have that pulled back a little bit every now and again. And I'm trying to find my best version of how I can live this crazy life, not totally affect my family too much and still, you know, have, have my sanity. <laughs> So how long have you been in Ohio? Uh, I moved, well, I grew up here, but I moved to Columbus in 99 and 90 and 98. Got it. Alex, I'm asking because I'm wondering where the hip hop influence comes from. Because oh, I, I remember yeah. when, when we spoke a while back, you're like, yeah, start with uh, Get Stack 32 or something like that. And like start on, your, on the hip hop covers. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like that because I, I had that idea like before I ever came here mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, ooh, like. I recognize that. Like, that's sick. Yeah. So I'm just curious. People like, love them. And that's like me trying to do a better job of just letting my full personality come out. Mm -hmm. Right. I was like, let's rip off the old iced tea cover. Yeah. Let's rip off the 50 cover, you know, for, for my, my programming. Um, so I, I grew up in a coal mining town country, but for some reason, the hip hop music of Pac and Biggie just spoke to me because mm -hmm. I think I'm living in this trailer. Poverty's poverty. Doesn't matter what color you are. And I'm just trying to get the fuck out. Mm -hmm. And so for some reason, and I think because it was real different than my environment, I don't know. I was always, I don't know if that was part of me. Like 
I don't know, it just became natural. I was there. I was the kid in sixth grade dancing to Vanilla Ice. It just felt natural, straight up. And so, like, to me, um, and then when I was hearing the lyrics of Pac and Biggie, and I was just like, man, this just makes so much sense to me. Yeah, I'm applying it in a different mm-hmm. way. The thing is, I had, like, the poverty part, but I didn't really have, like, the crime. So that was the one thing I didn't have. My parents were 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 solid, but they was just always working. My dad left when I was eleven. We had like a you know the trailer cost one hundred fifty dollars a month rent, so I just could identify with that come up. Mm-hmm. And so as I got older, it just became you know me, yeah. and that's why like now I'm super inspired by Nipsey. I never really consumed Nipsey Hustle when he was alive, and I'm a little upset about that. Mm-hmm. But now I started watching his interviews. He never fit in a system. He was always just doing taking the stairs, like so. I watched all his interviews. Now I now I feel his music a lot more. So that stuff just always I don't know, man. It always vibed yeah. with me. And then real quick, I think because I used to be a, a wedding photographer, okay. and Vanilla Ice always comes on for sure. And people ironically know all the lyrics. We yeah. can all agree it's a fucking great song. Yeah. Let's just enjoy that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that I remember like that was like the first time I remember like no one was like dancing. And I was like, oh, I got this. <laughs> I'm in sixth grade with the boat shoes. Like, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you can vibe with the new shit, though? Like, uh, some of it, yeah. I can Well, Well, say this is what helps is most of the guys that I train with are 25 or under. There's a few old dogs. We got a couple 40s and 50s, but most of the dudes are young, so they kind of... I'm always still late, though. They might know all the good shit, They too, right? know it, and they put it on the gym, or they're like, gee, you might like this. They know kind of what I like. You know so what? That's tough, man, trying new music. Like, <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, because you're just not used to it, but yeah. if someone else points it out to you, it's a little yeah, easier. Well, what they'll do is they'll throw it at me because like, they know what I really like. They filter it. Right? Yeah, they filter it for me. <laughs> yeah. so. well, it's, it's funny because like, we'll look at old super training videos. And yeah. I swear it's the exact same playlist today. <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> That's amazing. And then, you know, the, some of the guys in the gym, they make me feel like I'm 85 years old. Cause yeah, they'll, you are. Yeah. Because <laughs> they'll put something on and I'm just the grumpy old man in the corner. Turn that shit They're off. They're talking about like, the little Uzi Vert thing just dropped. That, I'm like, yeah. Not that far. No. <laughs> not that far. I can't take it. No, man. it's, but I, I've always been inspired by hip hop culture. It always just made sense to me. And as I continued, I just, by the lyrics, man, I just mm-hmm. I, drew, I drew so much inspiration. That's so cool, man. Yeah. Never heard you say that. So yeah, thank you for was, that. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What was uh, what's the biggest difference between uh, Muscle Farm and uh, the company that you own now? Like, what yeah. are you you mentioned it briefly for a little bit, but what are um, what are some of the major differences? Yeah, major difference between Muscle Farm and Max Effort Muscle, which is the new one. Muscle Farm is retail, right? And it was money raised, driven, trying to be basically like, we were trying to be like a billion dollars. We were trying to go crazy, right? I think that was obvious. This business at Max Effort is direct to customer. It's more roots driven. It's more interaction driven. It's more me. So like, here's what was crazy, right? How many people uh, work for you currently? At, uh, well, between all the businesses, there's probably a staff, we got maybe like six or seven, probably total. Yeah. And then not, Muscle Farm must oh, have been a like hundred plus. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing is, that's not really me. So, you know, I had a business partner at Muscle Farm that was the CEO. I was the president. And then after I got big, we had all these people in there. But at the end of the day, like I'd go out to Denver where we were based. We had this crazy like 30,000 square foot facility, all this gym and look cool. But there's no like that wasn't even me. My my dream gym's right down the road. It's called old school gym. Like that's me. So like that a lot of that stuff marketing wise was really Brad. I was on the customer tip. Like I was helping with all that stuff with the products and the customers I was vibing with. What do these people need to get results? So like we had kind of our own lanes. And then when it came to me going to meet Eric Hillman or the guy, you know, going to GNC and all, I could do all that too because I'm I'm fine in that environment. So, but the process of like that big public, it just really wasn't my vibe. This, this is much more me. And I think that, um, man, I'm just way happier because of it. So, but I, when I started that, I didn't know all that was going to happen. No one goes, your business is going to grow four times. It quadrupled like three years in a row. I mean, it was insane. So it's like, you can grow too fast also. And I think that was a product is I didn't have quality enough talent to run. It's just an honest thing. Like we, I couldn't run a business that big all the way by myself. No fucking way. I don't have those skills. Like, dude, I was a personal trainer making a hundred thousand dollars a year, three years before that. Then the business is doing 20 million, 70 million, 100 million. You got to have other people, and if you're growing that fast, you can't always staff that properly. It's just impossible. And so that was a big problem with that. Yeah, we're going to have all your friends work for you or yeah, something. I mean, it's not going to work, right? Yeah, it's just, it doesn't work. So, and more in the executive positions, you got to have guys that know how to run 
seven fucking warehouses that have a million bottles in them. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a different level of business, bro. Now this one, there's a lot of weird shit too with being in retail. Like they need to dude. know how much stuff's on the pallet, what you're, you so, know, the so, size of the pallet, how everything's packed, how everything's boxed, yeah. everything's wrapped I mean, up. We were selling like, Costco, Walmart, Jesus everything. Christ. It's a whole different animal. <laughs> yeah. So I really wanted to say this. I did it that way. I want to do it this way. I hooked up with John Fosco. John Fosco, my um, the other majority partner in Max Effort, he ran all the marketing. Um, his business ran all the marketing for Muscle Farm in the UFC. So we had worked together like seven years. So I saw what he was capable of. And I was like, man, I think we could really vibe on this together. And then we have Travis Brown, Clay Guida, uh, Dustin Myers, who's, was the, uh, who owns Old School with me and was the Ohio State wrestling coach when they won the national title here. And so like it was um, doing it like this. It was just so much more fun again, man. I mean, at the end of the day, I just want to have fun too. So there's a big difference, but I'll be able to say this business did this much, but the bottom line was X, which wasn't very good because we're always growing. And then this business, which is much smaller, the bottom line's way better. And so at the end of the day, you, you do business to make money, you know, you know, quality products and make money. Muscle Farm really never made money because we were just always trying to grow. You also get to uh, use your creativity more. Well, I'm more. sure like Muscle Farm at some point, you might have had an idea to do something, but it's hard to it. You're it's it like a, a corporate job, bro. It's a giant <laughs> aircraft carrier yeah. rather than yep. zooming around in a little speedboat. Yeah. When I was like having to request time off and and then like I had to have a meeting about a meeting. I was like, yeah, I think I'm good on all this meeting story. about meetings. Those are great. I mean, fuck. Let's I know you about, ain't down with that. Let's, either. Talk about this next, <laughs> let's talk about this next time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, we're sitting here right now. Can we talk about it right now? I can't fuck it. Like I can't I do that. I actually said that to Reebok when I was working uh, Bro, with them. They're the at, worst for that. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> I was like, hey, let's make sure that we don't come back here like a year from now and and have another meeting about this meeting. That's what they do. That was that was a cool thing though. So when I left MP, I signed the deal to be on Reebok with the same team you was on, and then started my website. And I just felt free again. First off, I'm a 30 like eight year old dude signing a shoe deal. I was like, as a rap. I was like, yeah, let's go. You know, I'm, th- I'm living my dream out here. I'm getting my own shoes or whatever. I didn't have my actual shoe like you did, but having a shoe deal was cool. And then um, basically then going into building content that I know had value. I felt like my face was on fire and we produce stuff, man. We got articles and videos and so much shit that hits every day. I've been putting shit on there multiple times a day, every day since 2015, man. There's so, oh, the library is absurd at this point. You've been consistent just because this is what you like to do. Yeah. I'm just capturing it, man. I got a really good crew of people that are helping me out, and it's it's been awesome. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah you'd be doing it anyway if no one I'd be was doing, filming it. That's yeah. why I said, like, in 1985, I'd still be doing this. I'd probably just have to have another job. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. Yeah. Um, are you able to talk about the uh, the Reebok UFC deal? Yeah, sure. I'll tell you I'll tell you that story, those fuckers. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what it was. So, we talked about it on the podcast. <laughs> the Smokey's and, laughing. And then, we <laughs> off air, it was like, you know, boo, boo, boo. I'm like... We got to do another podcast about that. So yeah. if well, you, you know can. What, you know what's so good, though, is I think the, the part of that story, which is good, is from something we're passionate about, we end up with great opportunity, right, to sign with Reebok. So I'm up at Reebok, and the CEO's lifting in the gym, because, you know, at that time, they had the gym. So I see him, and he don't know me or whatever, so I come over to him like, yo, I'm so-and-so, We just I just signed with you. And he's like, all right, good to meet you. I said, you know that I'm the only person in the building can fix your problem. And he kind of looked at me like, and this is CEO of fucking Reebok, right? And I just checked him. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, the UFC problem you got. You don't know what you're doing. But I do because me and my partner, John Fosco, we did this for a business that did over $100 million. We're the only ones that know what to do. Y'all don't know what you're doing. He's like, kind of didn't really know what to say. And he's a pretty reserved cat, but he was like, all right, yeah, maybe we should talk. I'm like, yeah, we definitely should. I'm like, there's no one else that has this skill set that I know. And so anyway... So I go and I, most CEOs don't have a light that aren't really on social, don't really have big followings. This dude had like 1,300 followers. So I hit the follow so I knew it would hit his email box. So I just got done talking to him. The follow up is boom, how am I going to get to him now? And so it's all strategy is kind of what I want to teach, right? And so then he obviously follows me back and I got a direct line to the CEO. So all the people that was dealing with me, they didn't even know I was doing all this. So I come to the office unannounced. Well, he knew I was coming, but the people from the Reebok like fitness stuff, gee, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, I'm meeting with whatever the fuck his name is. And that you'll see why I'm salty in a second. <laughs> so, right. So I'm going by all their offices and they're just tripping. Like I'm getting meetings with people they can't even get meetings with. So I get in there and John, John and I went up there and they just kept plugging us for info. Oh yeah. We'll get the deal to you. Plugging us for info. And so, you know, I've had a good relationship with them. We have a lot to value. We should have consulted with them to fix it. They spent 
70 million or 100 million over like seven years, some outrageous. Dude, they didn't put Northern Ireland on the shirt for this guy. Like they didn't even put all, like they, they were spelling people's names wrong. They were marketing or they had no fucking clue what they're doing. And what happened was, I think because we were so confident, that room like was deflated, not even in an arrogant way. We're just like, we did this for seven years. We can fix this now. And it was pretty reasonably priced. We had so many meetings and they just kept grabbing and then I see it end up on TV. And I grab a little bit more, I see it end up on TV. But when you're talking about like stuff you know, you have to give them a little bit. But ultimately, Adidas came through, cut 100 jobs because I think they don't know how to fucking lead the company straight up. I saw it because I had a solution for them and they would take what they wanted and they got 100 jobs cut. Those people just want to keep their jobs. That's all they care about. And then it ended up just kind of going into, you know, never came back yeah. around. They basically were just like, yeah, we just took as much stuff. We're good. So uh, you, you said Adidas, but you meant Reebok, right? Well, Adidas owns Reebok. Oh, so my Adidas, bad. Okay. So Adidas came through. The CEO from Germany showed up one day and cut 100, 100 heads and then sold the corporate office. So that's kind of my point. Like the leadership was a little bit soft. And so when I was like real direct and John especially was real direct because he's the one that was doing that for me at MP or with us at MP, it was like it, it was just some bullshit, man. That's why like I like what Reebok was doing for us. But when it got really got down to it, they, they fucking did me wrong. I set all that up, by the way. Yeah, you did. Yeah. No, you did. Absolutely. <laughs> but that's because yeah. you helped me out, though. Because I threw good... you supplements back in the day, right, yeah, Mark? Absolutely. Yeah. You were helping out me and Jesse Burdick. You were my yep. first sponsorship. And then what? Uh, <laughs> you set me up with bodybuilding.com, though. Yep. So I just want people we to understand that. each like, other, man. Yeah, I just want people to understand that that's the way this shit works. Absolutely. Just be good to each other. Yeah, no, and it's worked out real good. I've always, I always appreciate that, Mark. It was good. And that was, I'm telling you, when I signed that, it's so funny is I started the site and some other stuff, and it was going really good. When I told people I signed with Reebok, which I made way less money on than all my other shit, they was like, what? You blown up? I'm like, yeah, it's cool. I mean, but it's about to feed my family. <laughs> but, you know, but it was, that was a, so I had a story I told that I had to buy my first Reebok pumps used at a yard sale off my friend because he was like 6'6". Six, six, so he was sick. He was way bigger than everybody. So like two years later, I'm buying his used ass pumps at the garage sale. And I, I didn't even, I, I didn't even care. I still jammed my foot in them because I was the poor kid at the front of the road. What about those shack ones? Yeah, like I had those too. on them and stuff? Man, they were sweet. <laughs> Looked like someone threw up or something. So, so I wore, <laughs> yeah. I wore those pumps, man, to the day when I signed that. And that was like a real vindicating moment for me that I was signing with a company that I couldn't even afford a pair of shoes of when I was a kid. It was cool. Shit, I, I rocked LA gears. Hell yeah. I had those <laughs> too. We didn't have those at Payless, bro. Yeah. <laughs> they still make those? I oh, fucking hope so. We should bring them back, Mark. We'll <laughs> yeah. make them cool. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Rock yeah. some dad, good dad shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, my man. Where can people find you? Man, everything's at Corey G Fitness, just because that's the thing that I found that had all platforms when I was changing from MP. No, at Corey G Fitness, C-O-R-Y-G Fitness. and uh, Any new subs coming out? Yeah, man, we're working on a bunch of stuff. You always uh, got something going mm -hmm. on. Yeah, I'm working on a pump product. I'm working on vegan stuff. I've been kind of in the lab doing a bunch of, I'm working on a non-stem fat burner. So just trying to find the different combos, you know, to kind of aid what's going on. And I always tell people, like, supplements are going to change your whole life. But if you're busting your ass and you're adding them, you can definitely achieve way more things. I mean, I have people like branch chains don't work. Motherfucker, what? I've been doing this shit forever. There's no way I could have recovered if I don't take those. It's just impossible, you know, especially with the fasting stuff because a lot of people will argue that breaks the fast or doesn't. So maybe it breaks the fast scientifically, but fuck, I'm using it and I'm good. So well, <laughs> just again, that's like, my answer. <laughs> you know, most I know some people will say, oh, you know, I'm kind of doing some of this for health reasons and stuff, but... I think the truth is most people are trying just to lose body fat. Yeah, true. You know, and it's like if you take the amino acids and it like quote unquote breaks your fast, yeah. but it helps spare some muscle mass Come and on, you man. burn, you continue yeah. to burn calories or whatever. It's like, that's why you'll never see me fighting on Twitter with nobody. Just fucking about be, that stuff. I just need my vibe, man. <laughs> just be jacked. Yeah, bro. You just want to be jacked. That's Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Cool, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Appreciate take us it. out of here. Hey, Andrew. One oh, more. What's Check up? me out at business and biceps. You know, we do talk some fitness, but it's mostly business stuff, but I'm super passionate about it. So John Fosco and I have business and biceps, man, podcast, and y'all should vibe with it. It's cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Uh, make sure you hit me up on Instagram at I am Andrew Z. The podcast, please follow at Mark Bell's Power Project. Ooh, I almost said podcast. Um, <laughs> on uh, TikTok, Twitter, at MB Power Project, YouTube. Facebook all over the damn place. Thank you to everybody that's been rating and reviewing the podcast. That's been helping out a ton, and you guys are absolutely crushing it right now. Uh, Trensima, where are you at? Trensima Yinyang on Instagram and YouTube. Trensima Yinyang on TikTok and Twitter, Mark. How can people become part of that 4 a.m. crew? What do they got to do? Just show up by day pass. 
That's uh, it. What's, and the, what's the name of the gym again? Yeah, Old School Gym. Old School Gym. It's got to show up at what time? 4 a.m.? Yeah, exactly. come in 4 a.m. And we take guests all the time, man. People come in. and What days do you guys usually train? Monday through Friday, 4 a.m. Show up. Open That's challenge, it. man. Yeah, it is. It's cool. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you all later. <laughs>